couple of smart guys in the house, Tim and Ted, to talk about Trump and whatever else we got. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. Pleasure to have you aboard on this original program for this Wednesday evening. At least the humidity's down. Ooh, last couple of days have been brutal. Uh, Tim White, Ted Nisi uh, on set, which is awesome. And uh, I got to get their take on this whole media attack that Donald Trump uh, brought us yesterday. Before I put up headlines and like, I just have never seen anything like it. And I, I don't know how many times, Lexi, we've said, I, I, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, you sit there kind of going, is there a pill for this? As, as, he's, as he's doing his thing uh, last night. And what's amazing to me is that he has this, this night before scripted, admittedly, presidential discussion of Afghanistan, whether you like the policy strategy or not. There's at least a sense of, oh, he's got his act together and all the formality that goes around with it. And then the next night, he actually reviews himself as if it was something that he did as a play act as opposed to, you know, what he really wants to be doing as the president of the United States. I mean, rallies versus uh, presentations like the night before are just unbelievable. And what the purpose of the rally is is beyond me other than just uh, to give him, uh, well, there's a locker room uh, term I could use, but just to give him a little bit of self-buoyance. I don't know what the net value is. Here are a couple of headlines regarding the whole thing. Uh, reportedly, the crowd started to walk out. Oh, we're not supposed to report that, I guess, but it's probably the lying Washington Post that actually is, is after all that. And the Sicilian Langevin uh, want to censure Trump, which would be, a, I think, a, just a food fight that would have no net purpose in Washington. But uh, if you didn't see it, I mean, here were the, I mean, it was chronic, you know, laying it on the media. It's time to expose the crooked media deceptions and to challenge the media for their role in fomenting divisions. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Tim, Ted, you know these guys. Hi, Dan. Uh, hello, guys. Thank Good you for coming. It's hey. just, uh, I mean, our bread and butter is talking about what's happening in the community, and we'll get to that stuff for sure because there's so many things always going on. But we're working members of, of, of the media. We don't, whoa, whoa, whoa. We it's, don't like America. Uh, we're you know, not patriotic. It's, it's, it's funny, I, and you know, it's sometimes tough as a reporter because your your lens of thinking about things is usually as a reporter. You know, what does this mean for X, Y, Z, and everything else? Not, you know, how do you think about it personally? Or how does it affect you? But it is. Uh, I know for me as a member of the media to hear the president say, "I don't know if they love our country." Um, you know, I'm an American. He's he's my president too. He's every member of the American press corps. Uh, he's our he's the president of the United States. And you know, of course, are there plenty of people who agree with him? Clearly, um, do I think that us beating our chests about how we're getting beaten up by the mean president wins us any points? No. Do I think there's that much sympathy for us? No. But um, as a human being, I'll just say it's it's uh, it's uh, you just wish he might take a little bit of a different tack uh, when he's... Well, look, he went, he went to campaign mode. Uh, we're taping this. Uh, this is airing the same day, right? So he went to camp campaign mode last night, and he leverages this argument to what he sees is his political advantage. Uh, and it worked, right, in the campaign, and he was back in his element in Phoenix, Arizona. I think the problem comes when the media bites. Mm. And uh, they take that bait and they take that hook and, and we're at a press conference and we've seen it before where the president and CNN's Jim Acosta are getting into back and forth about the First Amendment. Uh, there are plenty of policy uh, things to ask him about from foreign policy to increasing troops in Afghanistan uh, to immigration, whatever. Let's not waste people's time as members of the media by playing into that and asking them questions about, oh, the First Amendment and, and being mean to us in the press. And one other thing on it, uh, Dan, which is, you know, I think President Trump, uh, I think clearly he, he, uh, he, he feels at his best politically when he has a very clear enemy to point his people toward. Don't, don't be mad that the health care bill failed. Don't be mad at the gridlock in Washington. Be mad last year at Crooked Hillary, you know, where all the guys in the primary before her. And he doesn't have at the moment a direct opponent because it's, there's not an election at the moment. And I think the media makes a terrific foil, right? You know, I think I saw one of his pollsters or maybe a different pollster, or maybe it was Steve Bannon was said to have advised him just keep going after the media. Like that is that is an absolute home run winner of an issue for you. So as much as you might say, and you're right, like really you're talking about the media. You just you're sending more guys to Afghanistan. You know, there's such more weighty issues. But 
there, there's just a, a ton of upside, it seems, in this for him politically. And here we are talking about it. Yeah. You are so right. And it is, by the way, it's an old game. It's mm -hmm. not new. Uh, Richard Nixon sent out his vice president, Vice President Agnew, to lay it on heavy against uh, particularly the network, uh, the, the networks, the New York Times, and the Washington Post, and they reaped huge benefits at the time from, from doing that. So the it's an old thing, game. The funny thing is, um, I sometimes think that with all the, you read, you know, we I see the polls that like the media, we're like the only people disliked more than the politicians or the bankers more than or whatever, we're always yeah. at the bottom of the <laughs> booty respect list. But sometimes I feel in the community, as you said, uh, that there's a little bit of the, I don't like Congress, but I like my congressman thing. You know, Tim and I go out and about. People sometimes will recognize us because they see us on TV. Almost never does some, usually people are very nice. They say, thank you for reporting. Like, it's important topics you bring. Like, yeah. I almost always have very nice interactions with, with people in the public who are kind enough to of read. Of course, we're local media, stuff. though, Ted, right? And I think yeah. there's probably a difference um, yeah. between the perception of lo the local guys covering your yeah. town and you your, see your city the grocery than the national. Store. You know, we're not, right. in, well, and frankly, we're not, you know, these a lot of these network folks are paid millions of dollars. Yeah. You know, the, we're not. And, and, <laughs> right. And again, the distinctions are, are, are many in that you guys are <laughs> correctly perceived as non-prejudicial. I mean, the goal is objective journalism. Uh, you do an incredible job. You know, working to that goal every day. I mean, the the objectivity yeah. thing is something that I think is is a great conversation because it the, is. the human element yep. is always mm -hmm. uh, is always part of even great Target Twelve investigative work. Uh, something it, it, I'm sure Professor Nisi has right. talked about in his journalism <laughs> right. class. Well, I mean, it's, it can't be eliminated. Mm -hmm. uh, those who opine uh, for a living, like me, you know, might get a, a cross look every once in a while. <laughs> uh, so it's it's no. you know, but by and large, even even when I meet folks in the community, that same dynamic ex exists. And so so, I think uh, there's all sorts of distinctions to be had here. But you know, when we talk about it working and the strategy is not new, I, it seems to me that it's one of these things where it's a secure of a base which has got no growth, no upside, mm. zero. And I would think if if the crowd was actually thinning a little bit yesterday. Yeah, there might be an exhaustion level, even on the part of the base, where you think, really, you know, what else do you have here today? Mm -hmm. uh, now, that crowd wanted to hear that Sheriff Arpaio is going to be pardoned. Right. And by the way, he played that. He played that. We have that. We have a quick clip of that. Uh, uh, Cap, can you throw a quick clip of that on? Where's that? Yes. Yeah, we have. Yeah, we, we have that. Oh, we don't have the Sheriff Arpaio. Oh, we have B-roll of him. I'm sorry. Uh, that's Sheriff Arpaio right there. Uh, yeah, he played that like a, he played that not? like a game show. Yes. I mean, the presidential yeah. pardon power is so so unique, exclusive, and important, and he's playing it like, hey, stay tuned. Well, he was a reality TV host, and he's done that a number of times. That's now. right. He, yeah. I remember he did it with the, do I have tapes? Am I taping James Comey? I don't think that Army plays not. past the base. I don't think that plays well at all. And then the, the suggestion that the government could be shut down in order to get the wall, no more phony baloney. I know we have that. Believe me, we have to close down our government. We're building that wall. I mean, this is just a, a chronic promise, and somewhere along the line, he'll be able to say, "Well, listen, I decided that we're not going to close down the government." You know, I, you know, I thought better of it. Rallies seem to almost be, what? Um, I think he's in his element there. He's and, it ha and it doesn't. And it doesn't. It's like the rhetoric doesn't count. It, yeah. it counts to inspire and to jack people up, but when it comes down to it. You know, holding him accountable for what he says at a rally just really doesn't. Well, he matter said. Much. I mean, he wrote. If you look back at Art of the Deal, his book from years ago, you know, he kind of said that. I don't know if he said that. You know, you should straight out lie, but he had he had a version of like, you know, you say what you need to say to get the deal done, and sort of the not a lot of feeling that like it needs to be that tethered to you know a defensible argument or whatever like that, and it served him well. And again. I am very, very chastened by last year's election, where every pundit basically assumed he was going to lose for various reasons, looking at the polls, looking at how he did seem to have a very base-centric strategy, and he won. And I think, uh, I, I just think it's, I don't, it's, we're in a very different time, obviously, than we, than we have been. And so now, enter Hillary. Quick headline. We don't have the audio here, but uh, we have the headline. And she's doing some self-reading of her book, where she talks about that moment <laughs> You know, in the debate or moments when he when he chased her around, the, when he literally tailed her by four and five feet, and she talks about whether here he is, you know, <laughs> she talks about as she's speaking whether she should have turned around and called, "Hey, get away from me, you creep." Jo uh, uh, Josh Barrow from Business Insider, I thought made a great point that 
Uh, we were talking about how Trump, the president, likes to have an enemy. Well, he, he's going to get Hillary back for at least a month, right? This right. She just out. gave it to him. She's, she's going to give him a month of uh, remind, you know, everyone who, re who hates her a lot, even if they're not sure about him, she's going to be out there and give him that, you know, uh, punching bag or new adversary or however you want to put it. He didn't need the book. I mean, I mean, I can't. How many times have we watched a Trump press conference and out of nowhere he brings up uh, Hillary Clinton? She is always uh, the perpetual enemy. To but Donald I think it Trump. gins up the, it yeah, can maybe. gin people up, it, and it gets more tense. You know, we're talking about Hillary again. I haven't talked about Hillary with anyone in months, right? Because she's out of the picture, but she's going to be center stage. And she bit. wonders out loud whether she had turned around and called him a creep would have been an advantage to her. My my answer is no. In, in real time, it's easy to look at it from now. In real time, she would look like she can't handle mm -hmm. the tough guy that's trailing her. You know, a subtle "you okay" or something like that might, <laughs> might have been. <laughs> that would have been good. That <laughs> might have been good. But turning around and calling her a creep, I'm not so sure. A lot of great memes came from that, though. That's yeah. the upside. Uh, uh, oh, man. <laughs> All right, let's let's come back home and we come back. Lots going on. Stay with us. <laughs> So the Speaker of the House is, uh, well, in a different house. Gordon Fox, wearing a Red Sox baseball cap and blue golf shirt, steps out of a car after hours on the road from Canaan Federal Prison in Pennsylvania. This exclusive Target 12 video showing Fox back in Rhode Island for the first time in more than two years. Gordon, how does it feel to be back? I don't know yet. Fox says not sure yet to our question. A spokesperson for the Houston House, a 25-bed facility that opened in Pawtucket in March, tells Target 12 there is more flexibility at a halfway house or a residential reentry center, but Fox will still be under the thumb of the Bureau of Prisons. Residents are required to provide a detailed daily itinerary that covers any time they're outside the program, letting us know where they'll be, for how long, and how they're getting there and back. The 55-year-old former Eastside lawmaker must also have a job or be searching for one in order to be living there. Fox will be sharing a room with another resident. In 2015, Fox pleaded guilty to federal charges that he accepted a bribe when he was on the Providence Board of Licenses and for using campaign cash for personal gain. It's not your style to point to yourself, but subtly in that video is him more or less, hey, Tim, you know, <laughs> good you know, to see you. Know, as, you're, as you're, you know, what do you call that when, you, when you, you're stalking a, a newsmaker? What, what, what is that? Uh, what is that? The confrontation? Yeah, the, the, the stake out. You're staking yeah. him out yeah. here, but yeah. he's like, oh, I don't know. Hey, like, Timmy, good to see you. <laughs> yeah. well, and you, I mean, saw it, you saw it flash across his face. He's like, oh, it's Tim. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's like, yeah, it's it's seen each other again. in, it's like in quite some time. Um, he, he's always that, friendly. That, Say what you will. He's always been well, friendly. Well, that's the unique part of Gordon Fox. It's not like he developed a lot of enemies over no. the course of his tenure. I mean, the, the, bat the, 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 the battles that go on for budget and this and that, obviously there's confrontation. But he always, always had this kind of empathetic, you know, persona, you know, nice guy, da-da-da, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, he's doing his time. Let's see what happens with him. Uh, what does happen with him? How much more does he have in, in, in the halfway house? Yeah, so he has his sentence officially expires February 14th of 2018. So he's still a guest of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, even though he's in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. It is very possible, and I would even uh, say likely, that he will end his sentence on home confinement. He uh, moved from the east side to East Providence, so that's where he and his husband, Marcus, um, lived before he went off to prison, and I think that's where he's going to go back to before uh, February 14, 2018. Keep in mind that sentence includes a 15 percent reduction for being a good guy behind bars as well. So uh, they already calculate a 15 percent reduction, and that would be his official end date. Then don't forget, he's on three years of uh, supervised release right. after that. So I don't know. Is What is the news value now of trailing him? Obviously, that's newsworthy. I'm not suggesting it's not bad. What is the news value now of, of, of marking how Gordon Fox assimilates back in the community over the next few years? I think, I mean, I'm not, I don't think it's it's like headline top news. I think his arrival back was big news. Just the sight sure. of him was of striking What's to he going to look What's, like? How right. is he? Yeah, yeah, oh, he's back, right? Um, it's almost like seeing a ghost, right? You had someone who was so present to all of us who tracked the state house and then disappears right. when he went to prison. Um, and his downfall was so fast, too. I mean, he 
you know, one morning he goes in as speaker. A couple hours later, they're rating him. By the following afternoon, he's not speaker anymore. And then he, you know, he did come back eventually for a little legislating at the end of his term before he was charged. But I think I, th I think it would be uh, it would be fascinating if Gordon was able and willing to have a candid. Yeah, of course. Would I like him to sit down on Channel 12 and do a candid interview with us? Of course, I, for competitive reasons. But also, I really think someone who's been one of the ruling three, the governor, the Senate president, the speaker, who maybe feels sort of unburdened, you know, he's gone to prison. What could be worse, right? So just, does he have any advice to make things better? Has he had any, you know, did he have any time to have a revelation there? Of like and I think some things have happened while he was behind bars that he needs to answer to. I mm -hmm. think we've had some new revelations in 38 Studios since yeah. he went away more than two years ago. Um, and so certainly I think to answer your question, and Ted stole the thunder a little bit, the news value is when he sits down, hopefully sits down, and gives that full interview so we can have that broad-based conversation. That's what we're, that's what we want. Well, we still want to know really who, uh, you know, who was master scheming in that whole 38 studio yeah, situation. how did that first meeting that we finally right. found yeah. out about after he was gone get set up? Et yeah, at the same time, I wouldn't hold out a lot of hope uh, to get a lot more details uh, on this whole thing. Uh, it just, it's been, <laughs> it's just been so poorly handled from a, you know, a state point of view and the attorney general. And I wonder how exhausted da, da, da. people are anyway. And they, Do people want more details unless there's I, that? I, I you still claim that we, if we gun. had the, we're now seeing, and this dovetails into the Paw Sox thing, okay. we are now seeing the residual sick benefit of never having purged 38 Studios the proper way and being able to close the case with good guys, bad guys, criminal, non-criminal, civil, but a bump above. There's a slow bleed in the, in the cloud now permeates public-private partnership discussions here in this state and no doubt impacts poor Don Grebby in trying to get a deal for Pawtucket on more or less the same wavelength of system yep. financing that McCoy Stadium operates The Superman under. building as well, you know, I'm not, I don't know that that would still be empty if 38 Studios hadn't happened. Right. You know, and now they all admit, Conley was in here with me, the senator, the right. other day. Well, you know, in the post-38 <laughs> world, you know, we need to do the rolling uh, hearings all over the place. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I got uh, the majority leader in here the other day on the health side, and Sakarchi saying, well, you know, in the post-38 world, I'm thinking, you sons of guns. <laughs> you know, you could have ended the post-38 world in a much more effective way by policing yourselves. And then, of course, the attorney general who's on a milk carton. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, you, come on, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, they, the Rhode Island's elected leaders made their choice. I and the guess. governor pussyfooting around with yeah. a promise she made direct to you on a debate. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, and, and so they, and they made their choice. And, you know, if, if all they wanted was narrowly be able to maintain, you know, strong, you know, I guess they, they still have strong majorities, the Democrats, you know, who rule the state in, uh, in the two chambers. But if they wanted to actually be able to do much with their power or be able to have any trust if they want to do something grander, like a stadium or whatever it is, uh, they, they, I think they foreclosed that in a lot of ways, but they're handling of 38. I don't know that a full forensic audit or audit or whatever you would call uh, investigation would have completely uh, eliminated the hangover, though. They still drank too much. <laughs> and, you, you know, you have to get ahead of it uh, in the first place. So I still think there would be plenty of trepidation, I guess. Tim knows hangovers. So talk to so. you about this. <laughs> we, so we all know hangovers. <laughs> but I just, so give me 30 seconds. I mean, the pulse of the people is kind of this, ick, mm. ick. Uh, Worcester's, you know, competing. Pulse of the people, are we talking about? Paw Sox. Okay. Um, yeah, what, yeah that's, what, I think people are just sort of, ugh. I think you, you think? could, I feel like they, if someone, if there was this real strong feeling on elected leaders' parts, they could probably jam it through, right? Get Wrangle up the votes, push it through, have something to say to the public, you know. They're all afraid of themselves. But none of that, if without them feeling like that, and they'd also need to be united on it, because mm -hmm. I think there's also a little bit of a prisoner's dilemma where, you know, no one wants to go first too much because well, the Mariella other one could veto it. Well, Mariella thinks it was responsibility. Right. She fell down, and then the Senate president, who's got the thing with the Senate they did, but, but, uh, right? Worcester makes a big play or they don't. If they can put it together, they steal the Paw Sox. If they steal the Paw Sox two years from now, people will blame state government for losing the Paw Sox mm -hmm. when they didn't sit up and the people didn't stay up and say, yeah. keep them, other than the 10,000 people that are at the building. It's, uh, it's a weird time, post-38. <laughs> Be right back.
You know, speaking of the Attorney General, I, when Tim White's uh, and well, both these guys were working on this uh, Montanero Jr. story, by the way, uh, condolences to him and his family. Frank Montanero Sr. passed away this week at uh, the age of 82, I believe, the AFL CIO. Um, incredibly impactful guy. Yeah, incredibly yes. impactful guy. And his, his son, union guy, now head of the JCLS, which is the operating entity of the uh, uh, state government, uh, doubles the salary, goes to Rick, you know, keeps the college tuition stuff. I don't have time to go through all of it. Go on WPRI.com and <laughs> see all the work that these guys did on it. But the state police, two-week investigation, pushed it off the attorney general. And uh, we ain't holding our breath for a final resolve. Even Montanero Jr. has the right for some statement from the AG. What's going to happen? Well, I think, you know, the, the language we're getting from the Attorney General's office is uh, we might not know if they close the case without charges. If he's charged, of course, we're going to know. I think the way we'll find out, Ted, is if uh, someone from Montanaro's camp comes out and says, you know, Bill Fisher, a spokesperson or, or his lawyer, comes out and says the AG's office has reviewed it and they've closed the books on it and it's a clean bill of health for for uh, Frank Why Montanaro would Jr. that happen? Why, why wouldn't they do that? Well, they no, 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 no. I didn't know why wouldn't they do that on their own, but why would the AG let that happen if it's if it's known that there, it's in their They're office? They can't confirm nor deny. The AG's right. office is very, yeah, But the state very, police more or less confirmed to you that they sent it to the AG. And the AG's office is very They're not getting along, prickly. are they, the state police and the AG I, right I now? I will answer that. They are not getting along. Right. That's oh, correct. Right, okay. <clears throat> and well, and you just see, I mean, the AG's office, I think, is very... Uh, it gets its back up a little bit when you suggest anything that they think they don't have to do, you know. And so they they said they don't have to tell us what's going on with the case. They don't have to tell it if there's if there's charges. If you know about charges, that's all we we need to tell the public. You know, we can choose to do otherwise if we want to, but we're under no obligation to tell you more um, about something like maybe Montana. that's your next target twelve, not a specific case, but to actually evaluate this relationship between the state police and attorney general. They're not getting along, and it certainly doesn't help the quality of life of the people in Rhode Island. Yeah, I mean, I think time will tell. We have a new, uh, a fairly new I don't uh, keep, I like head, head of science, state you know, but I'm just saying, it's an interesting story, <laughs> well, right? Well, we also are going to have a new attorney general in a little over a year. Yes. Yeah. Which, Thank uh, God for that. Could make, I mean, you know, uh, Peter Nerona seems to be working as the front runner in the Democratic side. Not sure who the Republicans will put up, but... Ted Seidel running in as the guy that <laughs> says... Yeah. Ted Seidel, you got to look him up, is the guy that says, you know, Gina Raimondo more or less... You know, dump the hedge funds into the turlet, and uh, she ought to be prosecuted for such. Blah blah blah. Yeah, so you, yeah. we'll see what happens with that. But you know, you'll, have, are not you'll have someone new in that office in January 19, and it will be interesting. You know, we've only had two attorney generals in the last. We've had two two-term attorney generals. So that's 16 years with right. just two guys. By the way, see, did you hear Kim Martin's uh, discussion of Charlottesville? I mean, you want to talk about not knowing what the hell you're talking about? Excuse me. When he suggested that you know that hate speech need to be confined, I mean he has no understanding of the First Amendment uh, as a top law enforcement officer. Uh, I think eight years has been plenty uh, for Peter Kim Martin, uh, my opinion. Uh, but it's interesting that you say that he has no mandate to report out. That'll that's that's fascinating. Yeah, but uh, you know I think we could point to other cases where they have reported out that cases have been closed. Thirty-eight, of course. If that was they burp be my when example. they want to burp, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He's so eloquent. Dan. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> classy way to put it. Yeah. Target twelve. They burp when they want yeah, to burp. Yeah. No, that's not how they do it. There, <laughs> believe me. All right, guys. So we're out of time. Great to have you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, Dan. Insight. Uh, final word, and we come back. Lots of shows coming up this week that are important. Alrighty, hey, listen, uh, the aftermath of Charlottesville and some of the challenges for the Jewish community, we're going to tackle those conversations uh, either tomorrow or Friday. We're still working on, on that program, and there's always something. You know, that, that case of the principal that just got jammed up for not reporting uh, the molestation issue is a bothersome case. We're talking about it on the radio as well, weekdays 3 to 6 on WPRO. Thanks for watching tonight. We'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.